Welcome to Events Heist, the game show podcast about post-COVID events and the event professionals that run them. In this episode, you're going to be hearing from Heidi and Anna. Heidi is the chief executive guru at the Mice Guru. Hear her talk about meeting Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, and other celebrities at a Monaco event. Anna is the creative director at Evolve Events. She shares a bit of lesson about why you shouldn't drink coffee anywhere near electrical equipment during an event. Heidi, you've rolled a one. Okay. Great start, so Heidi, <laughs> how, many, <laughs> how many events have you been involved in in your professional career? Oh, uh, hard to say, but it's uh, somewhere in the hundreds for sure. <laughs> awesome. All right, Anna, you've rolled a two. And you're up the ladder. Good start. Yay. <laughs> so Anna, how many years have you been in the events industry? Uh, well, our company is now in its 21st year. So um, that almost, I suppose, makes us veterans of the event scene. <laughs> right, Heidi, you've rolled a six. Yay. Sounds good. What's the, tell us about the largest event that you've been involved in. Um, let's say recently then, not too long before the pandemic, that was an incentive for 1700 people in Norway. So we are a, a live events uh, destination management company. So our core business is bringing international clients into Norway in one of our many exciting destinations. And uh, that was an event for a German company with their entire headquarters where we built an entire Viking village for them from scratch. It was oh, a wow. lot of fun. Like we I, rented a, a bay on the coastline, privatized it. Uh, they had some hiking components leading them uh, to the place. And then when they arrived, they were welcomed there by, by about 100 Vikings in traditional outfits, a very authentic style a whole camp set up with crafts and with with uh, with the food and with the um, viking entertainment music and and activities like uh, axe throwing and bow and arrow and it was it turned out to be a really big great party all right anna you've wrote a four oh I'm like, no, I've not got fallen down. No, I'm okay. No, no, you're good, you're good. <laughs> How many events have you been involved in in your professional career? Yeah, well, I suppose probably a bit like Heidi. Um, I would say it's in the hundreds. And I guess when it gets to that stage, you stop counting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, I, I mean, because we've been around for sort of, you know, over 20 years, it's definitely up in the hundreds now. Yeah. All right. Tell me about the first event you organized my own six years old birthday party. <laughs> Does that count? Yeah, absolutely. From, <laughs> That's my favorite from, one. <laughs> yeah, from very early on, I always wanted to organize things and bring people together and, and like help them uh, enjoy a moment. You know, that was always kind of my thing. All right. So uh, what's your post event junk food slash drink slash stress relief activity? Well, I suppose it's, you know, definitely a glass of wine, occasionally a shot of whiskey, <laughs> depends on the event, but normally a glass of wine with the team. And um, in terms of foods, without wanting to sound like a scavenger dog, it tends to be whatever's left. Heidi rolled a two. Heidi rolled the two. She's down the manhole. Same question. Your, your favorite post-event junk food drink? It can be literally anything, but uh, agreed with Anna, probably what's left over. But if it's a, 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 an event that ran over several days, then I'm probably fed up with whatever is there. And then <laughs> I would rather go out. And if it's at a reasonable hour, have a proper good meal, like a good mm. steak or something, mm. you know, to just relax and unwind. Tell me about your first event that you organized that you remember? Well, I was laughing listening to both of you because I just put up on Instagram a thing yesterday. It was a picture of me as a child in my mum's wedding dress. And uh, it was talking about exactly this, that, you know, 
where do you come from? What influenced you in childhood to what you end up being? And obviously, although I'm an event planner, not a wedding planner, the idea of putting on an event appealed and, you know, I'm there arranging all the flowers and all of that kind of thing. Um, so I don't know, certainly at school, perhaps they don't tell you event planning is a job, is it? So you stumble into it later and realise, oh, yes, I do quite like all that stuff. Um, OK, Heidi, uh, how did you get into events? First of all, through um, traveling abroad for a season as a, as a rep for a travel agency uh, in my student years. Actually, earlier than repping, I even started uh, doing animation <laughs> in okay. hotels and stuff. So that's kind of how I got introduced to the whole tourism travel environment. And that lent led on to business travel and uh, even quality management and then destination management, airport management, all kinds of different positions I've, I've been through. So what do you love or hate about events? Love is things that we've talked about, the opportunity to be creative and bring a story to life. So whether that's a brand message story or an individual's personal story, something that they want to tell in a wedding or a celebration. So that chance to tell stories is fabulous. The camaraderie, and I think certainly in the last 16 months or so, the camaraderie that we've seen in our event industry as we've all come together and supported each other is fabulous. You can't run an event without a team. So I love that kind of connection, whether it's connecting with people that were there or people that are working in it, all that kind of side I love, along with the creativity. Um, and I suppose things I don't like they're probably the sort of things that people don't like in any job, aren't they? You know, difficult hours, last minute changes, budgets changing, that kind of thing. Have you met any celebrities on the job? The one event where I met most was actually when I was still a, um, a teenager in the back office team through some really great connections in Monaco at the World Music Awards. So that's where I met like the whole cast of celebrities that was there for the awards anyone from uh, Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston to you know uh, P Diddy or Puff Daddy at the time <laughs> the Backstreet Boys uh, whoever was in at that time I think it was 97 if I'm correct 97 98 so so yeah a whole bunch of exciting people I was literally so starstruck I was just a young <laughs> teenager innocent girl listening to these crazy requests that all these celebrities had I remember Mariah and Whitney like their teams fighting over whatever whoever had the best dressing room and then one wanted a white couch because the other one had a white couch and then one was complaining about having croissants on the breakfast buffet and they should have known she doesn't like it and I mean I mean, one needed like seven seven uh, electrical outputs for hair dry hair dryers because she had a team working on her, not just two or three people. Wow. And then they went and got it from the stage build because there weren't any at the hotel. Yeah, just crazy stuff all around. But I got to meet so many um, famous people at that time. Um, and, and that was both good or bad. It gave me some kind of insights into their lives. And I remember feeling like, okay, it's not all that glamorous either. Like um, I wasn't really impressed by how they were living life and the type of requests they were making. I was more like, oh my God, like, are you for real? Like chill. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, you wrote a one. Yeah, I thought that looked dangerous to close to a man. <laughs> Describe the moment you knew COVID was going to turn the industry upside down. Well, we were supposed to be doing an event in Shanghai, but um, and I think it was pretty clear that that wasn't going to happen. But we weren't clear that events in Europe weren't going to happen at that time. So, you know, the indications were there. But at that time, we still sort of didn't realise it was going to be a global issue. And I remember I was actually in Ireland and... Um, I'm about a week before everything shut down and thinking, gosh, could this be the last time that I travel? And I, when I got back, um, I mean, in Ireland, they were cancelling everything. They'd cancelled things like St. Patrick's Parade. But when I got back to the UK, we were still going ahead. So we had Cheltenham Cup go ahead. So people still were kind of hanging on. 
Um, but after that Cheltenham Cup got cancelled, then yes, everything did. And it was, I would say, it's pretty much instant overnight. Heidi, <laughs> you've rolled a nine. I didn't there you go. Dice <laughs> had so many dots. Ca- case in point, <laughs> case in point, you rolled right. double dice, but you still you ended up further back. Describe the moment you knew that COVID was going to turn everything upside down. I actually was one of those people who came back from a a ski resort in the Alps. (laughs) So uh, I was skiing in the French Alps and came back straight to an event production that we had in in our capital in Oslo, which was a a pharmaceutical congress. And then right after that, (coughs) the the beginning of, um, of March, uh, and at that Congress, we heard the first kind of hints of, 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 uh, of repercussions because there were some departments, uh, some markets of that client that decided to cancel their attendance. I believe it was Italy at the time that was in the beginning, really, really uh, seeing high numbers instantly. What do you way miss the most hum- about in-person events and what do you not miss? Oh. What do I miss about in-person events? Um, it's a funny thing with an event isn't it because there's the event itself but there's also all the build-up and that build-up is very much part of the event whether it's part of it as a guest the kind of whole anticipation and the looking forward to it but it's also really the bulk of our job isn't it is 70 80 percent is done almost beforehand so it's all of that build-up working as a team. Tell me about the industries you've done events for and what was your favorite? We do a lot of automotive and that's probably my favorite because, you know, uh, major car brands like to pick Norway as their backdrop to do premieres, uh, press Mm. releases, launches, road trips and such road shows. So that's uh, a lot of fun to work on. Tell me about your fantasy event. Favorite venue speaker? It's the it's oh. the honor it's the honor event. It's the fantasy event. Whatever <laughs> you want, tell us about it. Something akin to a festival with lots of different experiences. So you know, you think about something like Glastonbury, where there are lots of different tents for lots of different types of music, and I would definitely want that at my event, where you're going into different areas and each of them have different experiences um, to offer people. So you're really indulging and immersed in a 360 event experience lots of music lots of dancing tell me about the most stressful event you've ever organized i can um for example name a very small one that i've literally that has stuck with me in terms of of stress levels simply because the client was absolutely horrible to work with. <laughs> it was uh, um, literally someone that we had been working on the project for, for I think, six to eight months prior. This uh, event planner, the, 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 the one they ha- that came with them, was um, a pain in the butt talking about, for example, where the butter should be placed on another table that, you know, people were enjoying entertainment and there were some questions. Suddenly everybody needed to have uh, their own plates in front of them to grab some crisps and be able to serve themselves. Absolutely ridiculous stuff. Like you you, you couldn't even imagine it, you know? And then um, it went on for days with just the most <laughs> stupid details. And I thought, like, in the end, I really, I, I kind of like, uh f- faced her and asked like what is the problem like you can see that everybody is having the best time they're they're saying this is the best trip we've been on and you can see everyone is just having the best time of their lives and she was like yeah but you don't understand uh the director of this group has to see that we're actually working and <laughs> i was like huh what like i mean we've been working on this for months we've been planning this in detail it's the the whole point is that it runs smoothly at this time or you wouldn't have done your job properly but no she was imminent that they had to be running around fixing stuff so she was literally creating issues to show <laughs> the client that she was busy fixing them <laughs> so what's the weirdest food oh up the ladder Ooh. nice uh, what's the weirdest <laughs> food that you've ever eaten at an event? There's a company in the UK called Lick Me. I'm delicious, and um, it's a good start. They're as good as their, <laughs> yeah, they're as good as their name. <laughs> so we love to work with them at our events. They're all about um, food inventions. 
So they will create food that might look like something, but tastes completely different. Um, so they'll play with your senses. Um, so I love that kind of food, something that surprises you um, or isn't something that looks something and isn't something. So I like that kind of thing. Okay, Heidi, you wrote an eight. Uh-oh. Oh, no way. <laughs> Okay, let's go. Lifeline, Anna. <laughs> What's your emergency kit during events? I would definitely have a charger. <laughs> and also or I 10. would have an yeah, it's basics. Are I, in there, I got a they? new I got a new one. I'll see if you like it as an events person. It's it's yeah. a solar, it's solar powered. So uh, worst case, you don't yeah. have anywhere to charge, you just go out in the sun and it charges uh -huh. your phone. Yeah. Is there anything, any book you've read, uh, any material that you yes. think would be useful to event professionals? Well, uh, one that I'm particularly fond of that I've read recently and, and I've read uh, many others since, but it's still, I'm still stuck on that one. It's called The Serendipity Mindset. Uh, it's uh, literally about being open to creating possibility for chance encounters and opportunities, which I really, really loved uh, and is applicable to, to events as well. And there's, there's uh, links to the events industry in there. How did you find the switch to virtual during COVID? Uh, rapid. <laughs> so, um, a really, yeah, really, really fast learning curve. Um, I think like a lot of people in events, we were a little suspicious about virtual before we had to learn to embrace it. Um, but as soon as we had to embrace it, then we had to get on board quickly. And that's what we did. Like a lot of event companies, we created our own platforms. We designed virtual venues. And by Christmas, we were running a lot of virtual events, which was exciting and opened our eyes to the possibilities of what virtual can offer and the opportunity to connect audiences you know we were having companies that were able to have their staff all over the world join and that's a fabulous thing uh are you virtual events are you a fan not a fan so i am a total fan of of virtual and hybrid and i am pushing for more engagement more interactivity more emotion bringing back emotion to events rather than having people sit and watch and have to listen to speaker after speaker without experiencing it so our next project now is again really crazy like everybody we talk to are like oh my god are you for real like that's really taking chances but we're lucky to work with tech providers that are on board with us and that want to uh, you know create stuff uh, differently test things in their labs and and uh, and do everything differently basically to to what everybody else is doing tell us about your favorite event war story oh dear well there's always a few isn't there hidden away in that cabinet I, I think probably the one that um would still get me feeling a little bit sweaty now is um a conference a conference and a cup of coffee what could go wrong an innocent cup of coffee um, but it was the little cup of coffee that was spilt over the um, mix desk, over the AV desk, oh, just no. as the delegates were arriving oh. in the hotel and oh. actually did take yeah. down. Oh, the that power gives me chills. In the hotel. It gives me butterflies <laughs> in the stomach because I can just imagine it. Yeah, exactly. It's still, I still get the hives, the hair on the arm come up. So, um, that was a very unpleasant few minutes. So same, same question. Do you have any favorite event war stories you'd like uh, to share? I remember working on the on the, the Super Cup, the football the Super Cup in, in that was in, in in Trondheim in Norway not too many years ago with, with Nissan and their sponsor, sponsor program. Lots of just guests not arriving when, when they should have and then creating all kinds of chaos in the programming and the different sponsor events that they were supposed to attend um other than that i don't think i have any proper really really bad stuff happening like the usual little hiccups but but i'm i'm lucky and and knock wood or touch wood that <laughs> that nothing seriously bad is gonna happen anytime soon if you could have an unlimited supply of just one thing during an event what would it be oh easy <laughs> energy energy e energy <laughs> Ooh, smart. Heidi, you've rolled a 12. So I think we'll go back to single rolls now because you're gonna you need exact numbers to get to the mint. Yeah.
What do you think the future of events looks like in the next two to three years? I think that um, that in the first one up to two years, we'll see a lot of increase in, in live in-person events and people kind of want to forget about the virtual component because they're so eager to travel again and meet everybody and, and go places. But then I think a lot of companies are going to adjust their, their strategies when it comes <clears throat> to all the events they run throughout the year. Uh, do you think the hybrid events will be the new normal? What's your take on it? It's the new normal. I think, as Heidi says, people um, really do want to get connection back. And the first thought with that is live events. Um, if we can do virtual and we can do hybrid well, then absolutely they're going to be there because of this access um, that they offer. I think also, obviously, in terms of sustainability, you know, you're knocking out travel and so on. So they're definitely going to be there. Um, but I think for them to work and be compelling, they have to have this way of engaging. It's what Heidi's talking about, about getting the emotion in there. They need to be shorter, slicker, more dynamic and more strategic. And I think if you're at a hybrid event, it's got to be good for both audiences to work. If you could pick a pet for an event, an event pet, what would it be? I think a dog is still going to be the cutest pet, isn't it? It attracts everybody. Everybody loves dogs, especially like cute little puppies. <laughs> that would be great to, to, to have like a, a little mascot running around. Oh, All right, yeah. Anna, you rolled a two. Oh, you're at the mint. You are the oh, winner. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you both and you can answer the one you want. So either okay. your craziest attendee story or... If you could give one piece of advice for planning a great event, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. I can't think of crazy guests. There are loads of crazy guests, but those are tricky stories to share, I think. Oh, well, then you should of... pick the trickier story and share that one. Because they normally involve alcohol and yeah, foolish no, behavior. Yeah, no, please, please. This is <laughs> no, an I adult show. I, I want to hear. I definitely want to hear this. <laughs> yeah, when me people too. are reluctant to now. tell me the story, it just makes just, me want to hear the story. Name Leaving their dignity far behind. I can't share those. <laughs> well, you don't have to name um, names. It's there's no yeah. there's no we don't know who the person no, is. No, no, no. no? It's, it's the event frost pack of um, you know promise of discretion. Oh, <laughs> now you just te you're just teasing us, Anna. <laughs> yeah, both Heidi know, and I exactly. are both now like dying like, to know on. what the story is. <laughs> No, I'm going to go advice. No, okay, that's really okay. boring. Now I've teased you, isn't super, it? Super, super. After you've after you've yeah. set up that story, yeah, I'll be. I can't. I can't lie. Yeah, I'll be I, disappointed. I can't even give the advice. It's just so disappointing. Sorry. <laughs> Don't serve too much alcohol. That's my <laughs> advice. Because <laughs> otherwise, you get the other story. <laughs> which is what? Which is what exactly, Anna? Like, I'm dying to know this story. <laughs> that's another podcast. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, Heidi, I'm going to ask you last question too. How do you think Zoom fatigue is affecting virtual events and hybrid events? Well, you know, I don't think there is such a thing as fatigue. Um, I've heard, I think the first one I've heard say that was Sean Specy. I don't know if you know him, uh, but uh, I've repeated that on many occasions because I think that fatigue only comes from being bored. Like you can literally sit and watch TV for hours and be engaged and entertained and have a good time. True. And you will never feel like, oh my God, now I'm fatigued. I need to switch up the TV or, you know, unless you want to go to sleep late at night. But um, I think it's all about engagement and, and delivering the experience and the emotion rather than having people to just sit in on a typical webinar type thing and get bored out of their minds so that is to me the solution to any type of notion of fatigue just don't be boring <laughs> yeah thanks so much for being guests of event heist it's been absolutely amazing having you on